Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is the second day America's question and answer session. And um, I'm your host, Gunnar Blom. You all know me by now. And we have our amazing uh, CEO, Megan Peters, here again. And we have a VIP guest, <laughs> Aldo Fizal. Uh, Aldo is a Hi, of, uh, uh, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the Imperial College London. Aldo, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Hi, everyone. Um, I started in computational neuroscience of ion channels and worked slowly my way up over the years to work on humans. And now I'm very much interested in understanding what algorithms and representations do human uh, use uh, to, to learn and control skilled behaviors. And on the other side, I'm interested in how we can build machines uh, that make use of the same algorithms and representations to solve probably similar problems as humans do. And you have an amazing book featured right behind you. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we wrote a book um, called Mathematics of Machine Learning because ultimately we end up using a lot of machine learning. And we wrote it up and it's free for everyone to download off our website, which I'm going to post in the chat. And thank you for the book. That would be amazing because I think yeah. lots of people here would be very interested in that. It would carry all the math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in order to give everyone a little bit of time to ask questions and vote, and people have started to do that, but maybe we we'll, uh, might uh, uh, like to have a little bit more time. What I suggest we do, so today was, was all about how do we actually approach the modeling exercise, right? And the students essentially went all the way from here's a particular phenomenon that we don't understand to Here's my model and here's a publication, which essentially was a, in form of a small abstract. So, so my question to you, Aldo, is when, when you encounter a phenomenon you don't understand and you want to model it, where do you start? How, do you, the, how does the process work? I think the question starts, where do I encounter this phenomenon? Do I encounter it in, in a very complex amount of data where I don't know where there's so much data and I'm trying to understand, oh, that's that's funky and weird. Or is it something where which I observe directly, some 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 weird effect, uh, I don't know, of how a human learns to do something. So it, 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 it depends a bit from what direction I'm coming. And I think the first thing to do is once you start modeling either of these two approaches is to become aware of what my assumptions are, what, what assumptions I'm injecting, um, what assumptions may I not be even conscious about. Um, and, and try to basically write them out and then see whether I'm at the moment just trying to confirm my assumptions or whether I'm really open and prepared to explore what possibilities there are. And so when you come from a data-driven end, I, I tend to do the latter. And when I come basically from, from a bottom up, from, from basic understanding and, and building you know, one brick on top of another of understanding, then, then I'm trying to, to come from the former approach. Great. Megan, do you want to give us your take on this? Oh, where do I start? I, I guess I would agree with with Aldo that it's it's about um, where does it come from. Usually for me, uh, well, what got me started in modeling was was the kind of bottom up like experience the visual illusion or like a multi sensory illusion that kind of thing where it's like this doesn't work the way I expected it to, um, and and so maybe that's probably where I'm I'm still coming from in a lot of ways is that I see like a phenomenon that's not because I study more, much more behavior right now than I do like massive data sets, I use the massive data sets to try to understand the behavior, that it, it starts by observation of a phenomenon that I don't understand in, in like the behavior or like I did this manipulation and like the agent, the organism, which is in my case, usually a human, reacted in this way that I like completely did not expect. Um, and, and then that sets you on this path where it's like, okay, well now I really need to understand it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to sleep at night until I figure out why this is the case. So that's probably where I come from too. Great. Okay, let's uh, see what uh, our students and TAs uh, are asking us here. So there's a the first question uh, that got quite a bit of votes actually is from uh, Emily Eric Jones, and Emily asks philo a philosophical question. When your data has some structure that your model can't capture, at what point do you label it noise in your data? For example, the noisy behavioral data from the intro lecture versus actual parameters that your model is missing or has abstracted away. 
who would like to give that a shot? I'm happy to shoot at it. Um, so I think, I think, I think it depends a bit on the community that you're in, uh, uh, what people call noise and what people don't come call noise. I mean, I come originally from biophysics, so for me, noise needs to be really some form of physical process that is random and stochastic. Um, and often, in other cases, people explain what noise is as being simply, you know trial to trial variability, you repeat the same thing, something else come out. And then in the end, when you're a very statistical or model fitting community, you simply say noise is everything that's not explained. And I think that's dishonest because it basically masks the assumptions. And in these cases, I really usually speak about variability or unexplained variability um, and not use the word noise. Noise for me means there's a process that generates randomness in there. Megan. Do you want to add something to that? <laughs> um, well, so yeah, I mean, in in the way that I fit the models, it's probably this way that that Aldo has just called dishonest, which is like all the stuff that I can't fit. <laughs> um, but I, I think that it's um, it's worthwhile taking a look at those assumptions and saying, um, well, this is all the stuff that I can't fit, and rather than do the thing that Aldo has now called dishonest, um, but let's try to parcelate that out and say, okay, well, which parts of this are uh, potentially explainable by things that I could assign to parameters. Uh, and so rather than just lump it all together into noise um, and that there is, there's always gonna be structure that you can't capture, but this is kind of the, the part um, of the model development where you go and do a deep dive into the literature and you look at like what's been done before and you see, uh, well, this is the part that my current model can't explain, but then you go back to the beginning of the cycle and that crazy diagram that, that Gunnar showed in the outro of today, where it's like, it's not this you know beautiful little cycle where it just goes through the 10 steps and then you go back to the beginning. It's actually like this crazy thing with all the arrows going like every which way. And and so then you, you have to go and say, okay, well, this is currently unexplained, but can I parcel it out? Um, and how do you do that? Well, that's gotta come from from the literature what's come before. So how, how do you, so, so I wanna, I wanna maybe like uh, ask like a follow-up question that goes in the same direction. When, when do you know that noise is noise? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're having a real philosophical discussion here now. <laughs> I like in that direction, right? So at one point you give up and say, yeah, this is, this is truly noise. This is, there's nothing in there. Well, how do you know? Well, so, I mean, I've written uh, a few years ago a review on, on on what is noise in the nervous system, and, and people can argue about that. I've posted the link in the chat. But um, if, if you think at the bottom level of what actually constitutes the nervous system, it's, it's chemical and physical processes. And, you know, some people say, you know, noise is something that I cannot predict, but, you know, also some, some very complex mathematical equation is unpredictable. See the last digits of, of pi, for example, um, or, or, you know, some form of chaotic dynam dynamical system. That's not noise for me. Noise for me really means that you have a true random process. And where you encounter these random processes is in chemistry because you have neurotransmitters that are diffusing and diffusion uh, by most standards and accounts is a, a random stochastic process. But ultimately, everything has to do with molecular interactions. So the flipping of an ion channel that allows you to see, um, uh, you know, spike uh, in action potential, or in fact, the rhodopsin in your eyes that makes you see things, they're all subject to quantum fluctuations. And these are all truly random processes. And in fact, you can see right now a number of these quantum processes at play because I'm in a fairly dark room, it's very late here in England, and you can see some of these quantum fluctuations triggering these little white dots in the camera image. So that's for me, true noise. But how do you figure out when that is actually true noise? Because it's it's easy to say from the generative process point of view, right? But when you have data that you just observe, what do you, what do, you do? You, you, you don't measure every single synapse in the behavior. So is that behavioral noise? What, what, what where, you know? Yeah. I, 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 I think that's a great question. I think that's we're interesting. The modeling come back, back uh, comes back in because now you're asking yourself, okay, how much of this unexplainable or unexplained variability um, could actually be from aggregates of noise at a lower level of organization from uh, proteins or molecules and so forth? And this this allows you to get an estimate um, or lower bound on how much noise you can actually have at this level of behavior, or whether there are under processes at play that you're not seeing. I think the biggest challenge in modeling is that very often you have systems that have a lot of memory. So, you know, you do something to it, 
um, but the the response changes and you don't necessarily understand what the relation is. Very often you simply have not a noisy process, but a deep memory process, for example. Cool. Okay, let us take another question. Um, in tutorial two, so this is a question again by Emily Airy Jones. Um, in tutorial two, why do we take the final value of the filtered vestibular signal instead of looking at the entire signal? Are we assuming the vestibular system is accumulating evidence? Um, yes, so, so the vestibular system senses acceleration. So if we want to compare that into, um, or have a velocity judgment, then we need to integrate somehow, right? Um, and whether the integration is over the full time window that we have given you the 10 seconds of the, of the sensory experience or a shorter time window, you might have a leaky integration, whatever it is, some, somehow need to, need to transform that into velocity through integration. Now, in our example, we have arbitrarily chosen the last value because that is essentially taking into account all the sensory information that is given, but you could do something else. You could, you know, say like, hey, I'm going to take the maximum. I'm going to take, I don't know, um, a, a different criterion, right? You can have a, 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 a low pass filter and take the maximum of that. You, I mean, there's, it's an arbitrary amount of choices you can potentially make. Now, all these choices might not be necessarily realistic in terms of the physiology. So here's where some of the background knowledge and modeling would come in. So for example, we know that in the vestibular system, integration actually does happen. It's super important to disambiguate um, motion, um, uh, this, or disambiguate this, the, 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 the signals from the ortholits and the, and the semicircular canals, for example, to figure out whether we are actually moving um, in translation or whether our head is rotating, for example. Um, on top of that, we know that, that in terms of vestibular perception, so balance perception or self-motion perception, we actually do integrate those signals. Um, and so this is where, where the idea comes from. Now, there's a lot of things that are, that tend, that are actually not known about this. Um, vestibular perception um, is, is kind of uh, understudied, I would say. So, so for, the, for the purpose of this exercise, we have arbitrarily chosen a criterion. Um, whether that's reality or not is, uh, is, is not up to us uh, to tell. And, and again, I might, I, I might want to emphasize here that the, the tutorials were built around a phenomenon that has not been explicitly modeled. Um, and that was on purpose, so you can't just look up the, the, the right solution, right? Um, but the other, the other, the other um, um, aspect to this tutorial is that it's not important what exactly we modeled. We tried to use something simple but also intriguing. But the purpose was to, for you to experience walking through all 10 steps of how to model, not so much to come up with the best possible model at all, actually. The, the model that, that, that we made you build, essentially, is pretty crappy. Um, but, but, but the point is to highlight some of, the, some of the issues and some of the questions that you should be encountering and that you will be encountering when you scale this up to your project work, for example, or to your own research work. So this is mostly what this was about. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I you wanna... that, the, that the model doesn't work great um, because like, that's often what happens. Don't highlight me. That's you don't need to highlight me. <laughs> uh, but but I, I like I like very much that that the model doesn't work because often we have this this kind of false sense of security um, that comes from the publications in the modeling literature where it's like oh look we built this very sophisticated model and uh, it perfectly captures the data and that there's it's only like very small amount of unexplained variance and uh, and great so then this is the answer. And so by walking through all of these steps and building, yes, a, a simplified modeling framework, of course, we can't build, you know, something super complicated in, in just a few hours. But, but by walking through all of this and getting to a model that like sort of works, but that also fails in some really important ways is actually very representative of the real modeling process um, in, in a way that I, I don't think comes across when you read publications or even when you go to a talk and you hear people talk about the modeling process. Uh, and, the, and the result, people are very focused on, I go to this conference and I present the thing that worked and look at how pretty it is. And all of the other things that we did, I'm gonna bury in the supplemental material to show you how robust the model is. And I have to convince you that I'm right. But the reality is that 
it's it's not clean a lot of the time. And so I really like that this tutorial today showed how not clean it can be and how that kind of inspires new experiments and new ways of looking at stuff. Aldo, do you want to add something to that? I think this is very comprehensively answered by Megan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and hopefully that will also give you a bit of an idea of the expectations for your group projects. The expectation is not that you will be able to produce a nature publication of a, a particular model. The expectation is that you have an idea that you explore. And it's very likely that that idea will fail. And it will not give you necessarily the results you were expecting. Or it might not work at all. Who knows? But the, the, the whole point is not the end goal. The point is the path. You will be, have lots of time after the fact, after Neuromatch Academy, to, to, to reach the end goal in your own research, or maybe even in your, in your project um, um, topic, if you, if, you, if you choose to pursue that later on. But, but here, the, the, our main goal is really to make you experience the, the modeling endeavor and, and, and really like do this in a systematic way that allows you to um, critically think about every single step and make sure you don't get lost. And often the way they fail is actually like kind of the interesting part because you, you go into a project being like, I totally know how this works and I have this really cute idea. And obviously if I do this experiment, it's gonna work this way. And one of like my favorite projects that I ever did, I went in being like, well, obviously the whole literature says that it should work this way. And so if I just do this cute experiment and I build this cute model, then it should work. And it like totally did not work that way at all. And, and then we had to explore why, and we had to understand what the mechanisms were that were actually at play. And, and this is actually one of my favorite projects that I've done that's inspired a lot of follow-up experiments and follow-up thinking, um, and that changed my perspective. So, a model failing in your in your group project, it's going to fail in interesting ways, and that's going to teach you a lot of cool stuff. I think the same is true for experiments, actually. Like I tend to tell my students that uh, you know, if when you do an experiment and you have like a prediction of what will come out, and you find exactly what you predicted, it's kind of disappointing. You have learned nothing really, right? You already expected that to happen. So, so, so it's sort of like, well, yeah, fine. Now we can write it up, but like you haven't really learned anything. Whereas if it, if the experiment fails in a way that something unpredictable happened, right? Oh, now that's interesting. Now here's something I haven't understood. Here's something I can go dig in, right? And it's it's the same thing with modeling. You think, oh yeah, this is an easy mechanism. I can I can model that just by using X, right? And you do it, and then you're like, oh wait a minute, this does not work at all. Why is that? And all of a sudden, it's an opportunity to learn something new. And that, that's, that's the fascinating part about science, right? So the job of the scientists is to make themselves unemployed. The problem is they're always <laughs> discovering more questions that don't go as predicted. And in fact, that's what makes science exciting. That goes back to, to the point that we had earlier about um, it challenges our assumptions. Because if everything is as you assume, then you have understood everything. But then probably it's also not so interesting. Um, OK, let's take another uh, question. So this is a question by Selena Beza. Um, I've read some papers that claim noise actually helps or enhances information transmission. Okay. How do we distinguish between cases where noise is detracting from signal versus enhancing it? I think that's a great question. And so I think Ital already mentioned um, an effect that's called stochastic resonance. And that's, a, that's been an, an effect that was discovered in physics, actually. Uh, actually, even before then, in, in World War II, when, um, when, when British bombers had to fly and use mechanical calculators to determine when to drop a bomb so it would hit the target. And then they discovered that these calculators wouldn't work particularly well when they were on the ground. But when they're flying and the whole plane was rattling, uh, these mechanisms would produce more accurate mechanical results. So the idea of stochastic resonance is, 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 is a favorite of physicists. The issue, and, and people then look for it in neuroscience. And effectively what it does, it brings weak subthresholds input. If this is the threshold, the signal is here. But sometimes if you have just noise, you put things over threshold. So it generates um, potentially a lot of false positives. If you don't care about them uh, and you just want to get more forward warning, then that's a user, fairly usable technology. And in the nervous system, you find that, for example, in, in shark uh, sensory neurons, uh, when they're basically trying to sense flow streams and in a number of other insects. But I think the challenge also 
if you want to now go to the next question, is so where else can you can help noise help you in computation? Is if you're looking into what machine learning is doing at the moment, right? So here you have so-called uh, Monte Carlo or sampling-based approaches, and there are various theories. Uh, colleagues like Marta Yengel looking at ideas about that the brain may actually perform some form of sampling um, and basically solve complicated inference problems in that way. So. These are all possible ideas, but I think the easiest way to, to distinguish them, because your question was also about how to distinguish what it comes from, is that effectively at the low level, at the molecular, cellular, you know, protein level, chemical level, so to speak, when it gets really wet, then noise is generally a big hindrance you have to overcome because we have really crappy hardware if you compare that to what we have on a digital computer. If you the higher you go, so the more or organization and um in algorithmics and software you can basically implement, the more you can effectively turn this disadvantage of having noisy systems into a feature for fancy computation with noise. And, and so basically, I would really look at what level uh, you're looking at. Are you looking at the calculated computational level or are you looking at the implementation level? That's a guide, it's not, but that's how I would structure things. There's also a very concrete potential answer to this question, which is, you can build the model and you can crank on the noise parameter and you can see what happens, right? Um, and so this is what we do in, in when we're building like, for example, like, you know, variational autoencoders or, you know, something like that, where you can actually fiddle with the noise in the system. You find not just the stochastic resonance, but you find in machine learning how much noise actually makes the system more robust to avoiding uh, adversarial attacks or, or stuff like that. And so you can have a very mechanistic answer to this too, which is, uh, that's the fun thing about simulation and modeling in general is that you can actually build this in as something that's a knob that you can play with and then you can go look and see what happens. And we have another noise question here by Alex Lassell. Uh, why is the vestibular signal system so noisy? Uh, was it just because of slow speeds? So that was in the tutorial, the speeds uh, of the self motion were relatively um, low in the, in the um, moving train illusion. Um, or is the vestibular system inherently noisy? I'm a vision scientist. I'll let you guys take this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an ex-biophysicist. But um, no, look, I think ultimately anything that depends on the flow of liquids detected by microscopic hair cells is ultimately limited by thermal fluctuations. And that actually really sets the noise level. And so, in fact, um, I've pasted into the chat a beautiful classic paper by Bill Bialak on, on how how these fluct random noise fluctuation, pure thermodynamics, sets the limits to both hearing and to a certain extent vestibular senses. Um, and it is pure physics that basically sets the limits. And the good news is we're effectively hearing at the physical limit. We're as good as the physics allows us to operate, which is cool. Yeah. And, and by the way, um, noise effects in perception in terms of stochastic resonance have, in, from what I know, first been described in uh, the auditory system, where when you have a sub-threshold um, signal, like uh, someone speaks to you, but you can't hear it, but it's just below the perceptual threshold, and then you um, essentially have some white noise, and with the exact same signal, yeah. all of a sudden you can actually hear it. So this is a typical or textbook kind of example of uh, stochastic resonance or or the, the modern more general terms i think is stochastic facilitation and there's actually that reminds me that the same principle of like injecting noise has been has been used to restore a uh, spinal function um where you you have like direct injection of electrical impulses into um patients who have spinal injuries. And in some cases, this is just enough to get the signal over the threshold so you can actually start feeling in your toes again. So that's, it's, you know, actually a very like practical, clinically relevant concept too, not just something that, you know, evolution solved in our hearing system. But yes, the, 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 the vestibular system is inherently quite noisy and you can actually test that. So if you, if you, if you try to close your eyes and stand on one leg, on a wobbly surface, but even on a hard surface with like uh, like runners or something like that, and you try to balance, you can see that you're like sort of really unstable. And and this is essentially because your vestibular system is just like noisy. It it really needs quite a bit of acceleration to to give you a faithful signal. And by the time that bit of acceleration is actually big enough, you're unbalanced now. <laughs> you need to catch yourself. 
Now, the, if, if you actually want to go one step further, what you do then is you, you, you do the exact same thing, but now you touch something just with your fingertip and not, not holding yourself, just touching something. And then all of a sudden you can balance perfectly fine. And the reason for that is that now the little bit of extra sensory information you get from the fingertip is sufficient for your balance system to work properly. Well, so my, my little demos that you can do in the classroom. Everybody should go do this, like right now. Like actually stand up and do this and like see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should all do that. Stand up and actually just like try to Ooh, get out oh. of your chair oh. and away from screens. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a fun little experiment to do. So uh, I, I recommend if you don't do want to do it now, I really recommend uh, doing this. Okay. Um, next question by Gilly Carney. And then I apologize if I butcher some of the of, of your names. Um, you, you feel free to butcher mine too. Um, as we, you know, retaliation is important, I think. Um, so I'm curious about circular analysis. So semi-analogous an 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 analogous to overfitting an ML. Here we, one, use the same data to build and evaluate the model, and two, consult the initial assumption when attempting to draw conclusions. Can you please, uh, please comment? OK, that's a very good question. So I don't think it's overfitting. I think overfitting is a different issue. I think circular analysis is basically putting what you originally had as a starting assumption. Uh, back into your data. It's a bit like circular logic. Um, you know, there cannot be a twenty dollar on the floor because somebody would have already picked that up, although you physically can see that. Um, so, so the idea, I think that's the equivalent idea that you have in, in in circular analysis. I think overfitting is a very different idea. Is where you have a certain amount of data, and basically without controlling for how using the data, you are basically trying to make a model perfectly explain that little bit of data. And that's fine if that's ever what you want to do with the data, but it becomes a problem when you want to generalize. So when you want to learn things um, that happen for new data points that you've not seen yet and want to predict where things are, that's that's qualitatively different from circle analysis. Yeah, and someone mentioned here that it's more like double dipping. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so typically, and this is this is this is you will learn about this tomorrow. How to actually do um, model fitting correctly? Mm -hmm. Typically, you um, you fit the model on one part of the data set, and then you keep some part of your data on the side um, that you then use independently when you're all done to do model evaluation and also model comparison if you have multiple models, for example. Um, and and that's not the only way, of course, that that you, that you can do that. You can also say, well, I'm going to use all my data. And then I'm going to make predictions. And then I'm going to do, go and run new experiments or get a different data set from someone else or whatever it is. And then I can essentially um, evaluate my fitted model now on this different data set, whether it's new or out in literature or whatever it is. So there's a there's a few different ways we can we can approach that. But you're absolutely right that the way we have introduced it here is not the the, the technically correct way. Um, but that again was not the point um, of the exercise. We wanted you to see the steps, and you will learn about the correct way of doing it tomorrow. Um, I hope that kind of answered the question. Okay. Well, I, I think that, that's good. Next question is from Vaishnavi Sukumar. Um, what about modeling when you don't have a ground truth or background information? Experimentalists perform exploratory experiments. Is there an analogous version for models? Can we make models when we don't know the inputs or the outputs? Hmm. I think that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, you can guess. <laughs> you have to make a guess, right? Well I, I think there are a few things. You know, in, you know, if you don't know the inputs or the outputs, then that's a bit difficult if there's nothing that your model works with. So that's that sits a bit on its own. But if you're thinking about, you know, you have some form of data here and some form of explanation here, and you want to relate the two, then there's actually a whole science about um, how you can try to fit many different models. So either you have a very very flexible model and. We call that deep learning. There's some form of a neural network that's very, very flexible and can try to fit an exam uh, and, and, fit and explain that. 
There are other approaches in machine learning called ensemble learning, where you're simply training many, many different models in parallel. And there's sort of a smart way by choosing um, uh, what model effectively wins, if at all, or you just use the ensemble of many different explanations that you have. Um, or you, you, know, you choose other methods that are, again, flexible. So Gaussian processes is another way for building models that relates to things. But ultimately, the question is, why are you building a model? You're building a model because you want to understand something. I mean, unless you're an engineer and you just want to predict and if it works, you're happy and you don't care why. As a scientist, you want to know why. And so here, of course, you're building, you can actually literally write down many different models that are consistent with different understandings. And then you can just, you know, make them compete with each other and see what wins out. And effectively, it means which, which of the possible understandings is winning out. And that's actually quite cool to observe. Can I add to this? Because there's a, a follow-up in, in the chat, which is, um, I meant if you didn't know one of the two inputs or outputs. And I think that this is also a really interesting question because a lot of times, or in the model today, we talked about like, I know what the signal is. I know how fast the train was moving. And then I know like what the you know resulting, I can put that as an input into my model. Um, but there are some times that you don't know what the inputs are. Um, but you can build a model that is, um, it doesn't have to have specific independent variables. It's like these kind of constellations of variables and that they, how they move together is part of your model. And so you can build a model that actually takes that into account and fit it, even if you don't have access to pure signals. Uh, so this is something that we do in like multi-sensory integration models in some cases where you don't have, like if you have a, a visual haptic signal, you can remove vision but you don't have access to, you have access to the actual size of the thing. You don't have access to like the actual representation of size in the brain and how that gets in, you know, used in conjunction with, um, with other signals in the brain. There are a lot of things that we don't have access to, but you have to make assumptions about how they work together. And then you can build a model that, that plays on those assumptions. So I hope that actually addresses some of the question too. <laughs> Cool. But, it, but in general, I mean, I would say that you do need um, at least a question, right? A question and a goal. That's what you need. And, and, and typically that means, the, 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 that means that you have something, if you have a goal, then it, that's an output somehow, right? There's something that comes out. So you definitely have, have to have an output. And, then, and in a way, you have to think about what the input should look like. I mean, you have to give a model something. Um, you yeah. know, you can, it can't just, uh, it, it's, it's not like a Papertium mobile or something that like, that, that just works on its own magically, right? You have to give it something to work with and you have to decide what that is. And that can be a very hard decision. And that is exactly why you should think very hard about um, the, the ingredients that you need in your model before you start um, getting lost in the model. And the standard approach is not always the best one. <laughs> no, for sure. Okay, um, there's a question about the interactive demo. Um, I think that just uh, got overvoted. Okay, let me let me ask. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not going to um, take like the detailed question here for the interactive demo. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but uh, um, but I think it's more interesting if we actually look at um, look at uh, the next question here. Before we do that, can I just say if we don't do the super detailed questions in this Q and A? Especially like starting tomorrow, it's going to be like really super detailed, and and the panelists may not you know be able to answer some of these questions, and that's okay. So put these in Neurostars, and start a conversation there, and ask your TA, and like lots of people can jump in. So if we skip a question or we don't get to one, like put it there and keep the discussion going. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rami Hamati asks, "What does comparing the condition, um, comparing the conditions?" Judgments are square value, and to predictions to judgment are square value. Tell us. Oh, okay. So, should we um, aim to create a model with similar R square value as a condition judgment correlation? So, essentially, the idea is that there's a correlation in the data, and then if you build the model, should the model um, give us the same R square correlation that the data shows itself? I think that's what I understand from this question. I'm still parsing this. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> comparing the conditions. 
So I think the idea is that you, let's suppose you have multiple conditions and they show you know, like a linear relationship across conditions. You can compute an R square if you want um, of the linear line, right? So how well the linear line fits all, across these conditions. And then the, the, I think the question is, does that, uh, I, apparently I got it right. So uh, that, does, that, uh, does that have to be reflected in the model as well? So does the model output also need to recreate that R square value essentially in the relationship that the model produces? So, so let's maybe ask the other way around. Can the model exceed the R square that we have in the data? Yeah, can the model be better predictive than the data itself? Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. So I'm, if the model is linear and the, the, in the relationship sort of measured in linear square, I would say yes. If the model is nonlinear, then you should be able to do better if you have a better explanation, right? Because there are things that are nonlinearly related. For example, you know, uh, the weight of a person and the surface area of that person, right? So there's a cubic uh, quadratic relationships, nonlinear. So yeah, they too correlate somehow, but not very well. But if you have the right model, then you can actually exceed that. So I think in some ways it's a science of a good model because you're explaining something. And which brings us into the question domain of, you know, are good models nonlinear models because things that are linear are sort of trivial. Yeah. So, so let me let me do it. So there, there's a, a comment in the chat. Isn't that overfitting? Basically, no, it's not. No. So, a very simple example. So, imagine that you have um, a relationship in the data, right? And that relationship is noisy, maybe because you have measurement noise, maybe because there's biological noise. And you build a very simple model that provides a analytical relationship, right? There's no noise in your model. That means that your R square is one. It's perfect, right? Is that overfitting? No, it's not overfitting. The model is just unable to produce noise. And that's just the way that you have abstracted. That's a part of your decisions. But it doesn't mean it's over overfitting as, as, a, as a result of that. I hope that makes sense. And again, you will, you will learn about what overfitting exactly means um, tomorrow. But essentially, it means that, that you have too many parameters um, for the number of meaningful uh, the men, uh, variations in your data. And okay. they probably have poor predictive power as a result if you try to extrapolate outside your current data set. Yeah. Okay. How do we decide? Also, this is a question by Rosanna Molina. How do we decide whether your model fits the data enough to publish it? That's a great question. <laughs> That's a brilliant question. How badly do you need the publication? <laughs> so, I, I think that's a good question. And I think the interesting thing is because publishing in science is as much a scientific process as it is a sociological process. And so it really depends also on the community. So if you think about a model R square, for example, how good is your explanation of the data? You can go into fields where people uh, publish an R square of 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 as a great result, right? Because if you look at very noisy, very variable systems or, or areas where the models are very primitive because the field is not very organized about modeling, um, then very low R square can mean a lot. In, in other areas, you know, um, in you know high accuracy physics, for example, you expect an R square of 0 0.99999 with many nines because you can measure things with a very high precision. So it really depends on the field. So if you want to know what works, I would look at the papers that you're reading and citing that are in the field, in the domain, in the physical system that you're studying, and and get a sense for how good of a quality of a model is. And maybe it's a fun exercise to look at the quality of the journals versus there are squares that are reporting for the same field, whether there's any correlation or not. Maybe you can model that too. And then you can ask whether that's actually real or not. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is totally true. And it's about like, even within a field, like the complexity of the phenomenon that you're trying to model, like you can't expect a sim. You said like there's a simple linear effect. You're, you're potentially going to get a higher R squared if it's like this very simple system. If you have a super complex system, a um, lower R squared is potentially very meaningful if it's like significantly more than any other model can do. 
But also remember that we just don't model just to explain the data for itself. Again, if you're an engineer and you want to build a facial recognition model that recognizes faces, you want the highest possible fit to the data. What you, but what you may care about as a scientist is what model gives you a great explanation. And if a model has a simple and clear, maybe even counterintuitive explanation, then even a not so high R square may be more appealing than a perfectly fitted machine learning model that tells you nothing about the system. Right? Yeah. So it's about the understandability or explainability or simplicity of the model. Or biological plausibility or yeah. you know, anything where like if you come up with this beautiful, brilliant model that perfectly predicts the behavior of your agent and there is no way that a brain could do that at all then it's wonderful that you've built this tool. Uh, but if your goal is to explain how the brain does it, then that you haven't achieved that goal. Remember diversity. <laughs> it's what you care about. And in a publication, you need to justify that. You need to say, I really care about this. And this is why I think my model is great. And yes, the R square is like 0.5 or whatever it is. It doesn't really matter. I have learned something important here and this is useful. And, and therefore it's publishable. I think this is, it's really kind of a trap question here. And, but it's a very, very important question. So I'm really happy that, that, that you asked that. Because, yeah. because people always ask like, okay, well, like, how, how, like how close does the fit has to be, have to be to, to the data for me to be able to be done and say like, I can, I can publish now. And there's, there's really no answer. And I think Aldo has, has, has described that very nicely. Like, yes, you can over-parameterize your model, just throw like a deep neural network at it, get like a super high R square and you have learned nothing. And that's just, it's, it's just not what, we, what we're looking for as scientists. Engineers might are looking for that, but not as scientists. We want to get some form of insight, right? So we need to abstract more, fewer parameters, parameters that have physical meaning somehow that we can interpret. And will the R square value suffer from that? Absolutely, it will. As soon as we abstract, we throw out details, right? Um, but it's very important that we that we that we realize that this is this is happening, and that we get our priorities straight from the start, like our goals, what we care about, that we state them clearly, because that allows um, ourselves first to evaluate whether we're satisfied with the model, but also our readers, the the, the scientific community to evaluate your model within those constraints. To be fair, there is not like no utility, of course, in like building a model that has a super high R squared. <laughs> like even if it doesn't provide ex scientific explanation, if you're an engineer and you're trying to solve a problem in the real world, this could help you discover like which uh, biochemical combinations are good targets for the next round of the pharmacological intervention that you're developing or something like that. And then you can go do those experiments and, and that kind of thing too. Um, so again, it's, it's really just about like, what is your goal with what you're trying to do? And of course, as a scientist, it helps you also understand how close are you to the best possible model with yeah. your understandable model, right? So it sets an upper bound effectively and everything above that is noise. <laughs> so I, I, I wanna take this question here by Jordan Lay. Um, how might we effectively use Occam's razor to narrow down what models are considered good or valid in explaining relationships in the data, especially in cases where it's not clear which models are simpler? Is there a more rigorous way of understanding which models make fewer assumptions? I think this is an amazingly great question. I'm, 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 I'm surprised it didn't get more votes. These are really good questions. Who wants to give that a shot? Well, I, I'll preface this by saying this is one of the things that I think gets talked about tomorrow a little bit, um, like simpler, but like, yes, man. Yeah. I mean, which models make fewer assumptions. Oh, boy. OK, I'm actually going to pass the buck here because this is a much bigger. <laughs> it looks like Aldo wants to say something. And I'm going to so, so I've, I've, I've space with a beautiful another free Cambridge University press book by um, by one of the smartest people I've met in my life. Um, and if you look at chapter 28, it's about model comparison and Occam's razor. Um, have a look. I think it explains from a very probabilistic generative way how we can think about that. Um, and so, okay, 
So that's for a very from a very mathematical view, if we can write down what we call a generative model and then how to compare these different models. I think ultimately, if you think about more in a qualitative term, you know, um, I don't know, I'm waiting for Megan. M Megan does not show up. Which of the three things happened? Megan was updated, up, you know, abducted by aliens. Her car broke down or she forgot about the appointment. Now, any knowledge that you have about Megan will, will probably help you understand that maybe aliens was not the reason for the abduction. So so you can make these these basically put these in sorry for singling you out. Um, but you, you, you can basically put these different elements together and then basically reason, okay, which are parsimonious and not so parsimonious explanations for what you're seeing. Um, and so even for very qualitative models, you can effectively uh, pick them out. Um, I mean, there, there are other approaches. Uh, so people look at something called minimum description length. So what's the sort yeah. of the most compact way I can represent things. And if models are more procedural, like like a brain, like a if you think about the brain like a computer program, people are looking at the basically at the at the smallest possible uh, pseudocode that you can write that describes what the system is doing, if it generates behavior, for example. Um, and, and, and these are very tricky measures to handle because uh, you know they're very theoretical measures. It's it's hard to enumerate all the possible ways you could compute something. But there's a, a beautiful example from uh, from Fly Vision Research from the 60s and 70s. It's called um, the Reichert Elementary Movement Detector, and it's about how does an animal detect whether um, how fast in which direction something flies if you just have the photoreceptors. And they're literally in one of the earlier papers, Reichert and Hassenstein went through all possible mathematical mathematical operations that you can write out to do that computation of direction and velocity. And, um, and then they pick the simplest one in terms of smallest amount of terms. And I'll find the link if I can. Yeah, so the, the, the um, and, and you will learn about this a little bit tomorrow, I think. Um, there, there is a, a way to um, when you when you develop models and you do model comparison, there there is uh, several different ways that you can penalize the number of um, parameters that you have in a model, right? So, for example, you you always expect that a quadratic function will fit slightly better than a linear function, even if the relationship is linear with limited amount of data, right? Because you have an extra parameter, so you can slightly fit it better to the to the amount of noise that you have in your data, for example. But that might not be meaningful. And so having methods that essentially penalize additional parameters um, in model comparison, for example, helps you to sort of figure out whether these parameters are really needed, do they make an actual impact or not. So there is ways that we can do this sort of systematically. Um, um, also in like <clears throat> building systematic, not just a single model, but like classes of models, for example, ensemble um, models. Um, where we can then do ensemble model comparison and we can essentially ask, well, how many parameters do we actually need? What kind of model among the thousands of models or millions of models that we can propose um, uh, would, would, would work best um, while taking into account that parameters or the number of parameters have, um, has a cost, essentially. And people don't even agree on how to best penalize models for the number of parameters either. So they're like, now I understand that I need to penalize my model for how complex it is. Now I have more choices to make about, you know, how how stringently should I do that? Should I really care about this or should I just kind of, you know, generally keep it in the back of my mind? Yeah, exactly, uh, Gabriella, like like uh, Bayes factors and um, like IK weights and, and BIC and that kind of thing. Okay, um, here's another nice question. Uh, Fenglin Zhang asked, um, how much should we trust data versus models? Any form of measurement has a certain scope and carries its caveat. Model can also sometimes fail to capture all the variants in the data. Another so, rather philosophical question. I love how, much, how, how philosophical this is. This is great. I love it. When I was a young PhD student and joined a purely experimental lab as, so to speak, the theoretical guy, um, no one, everyone was was never getting tired of telling me all models are wrong, and it's it's about how they're wrong that you may learn something. So 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 that's the that's the cheeky and, and unhelpful answer. And um, I think 
I think it also really depends on the field because, for example, in, in physics and in, in quantum mechanics, people trust the model more than the data and they're using the theory to, to fix errors in the measurement because the theory has been so well fitted. I think we're seeing similar effects now in parts of neuroscience when you're looking at very established model like Hodgkin and Huxley, where people are, you know, readjusting things in um, in, in the data or in the measurement systems, they're thinking, oh, something is wrong here because it's not consistent or compliant with uh, uh, with the model. But I think most of the times I would trust the data. The less you know about your model, the less well established it is, um, I would always trust the data more. Unless you have doubt to reason to doubt the, the sensors that collected the data for some reason. Which could be the case if you're working with a you know new neuroimaging technique that has not been tested very much or something like that, like then absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of like new and exciting work being done in, in advances in neuroimaging and the early data collected from those sensors is not necessarily reliable until it fits with existing models. And so then you use the models as the benchmark. Okay, here's a... Uh longer question from Samuel Orion. We came across neural denoising today. Are neural signals really so noisy or is it our ability to measure and or understand the complexity of the system? Perhaps due to the to assuming that the computation happens at the resolution of action potential, membrane potential rather than synapse, um, et cetera. And, and there's even a citation for a, for a paper here. But but I think the, 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 the question about uh, denoising um, is, uh, is is very interesting, and 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 how do and it sort of folds back a little bit into how do we know whether it's uh, if, if if there's a signal or it's just what we call noise. So yeah, I'm happy to take the first part, and I'll answer that with another citation um, as an example. <laughs> but um, neural systems at the cellular level are super noisy. No electrical engineer would want to work with such a system. Um, you know, um, effectively, the amount of noise that you're picking up in an axon sets the lower limit to how fine and uh, narrow you can make an axon, which sets effectively a limit to the wiring density of the brain. Um, you know, the fact that synapses um, have considerable amount of fluctuations and variability um, is, is another reason why, for example, if you need a very, very reliable synapse, they're gigantic and ginormous with many, many active zones. But um, that if you have to miniaturize them, again, just like in a computer, you can cram more computing power like in our human brains where we have the highest synaptic densities in the animal kingdom. Uh, you, you will find that you're actually dominated by noise and you have very high error rates. And sort of, you need to come up with different algorithms to then process in this type of domain. But brains are super noisy. Um, but it so, is very hard to estimate what is signal and what is noise, right? So when when I write a paper about uh, like especially at the sort of like the biophysical level, when you have like spiking neural networks or something like that, uh, we, we we essentially ca call this task independent signal, <laughs> and it, it's 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 modeled as Poisson and Poisson process and and like noise, but like it's. We, we don't know if in the real brain sure. there. But, but that's simply the unexpected. The, the fact that you have something that you call a task means that you have some form of behavior yeah. element. Um, but we always do, right? Well, in, in you know, if you report from patch clamp from neurons, there's there's not a lot of tasks that you're giving well, the neuron in, in that respect. Sure. So yeah. if we're talking systems neuroscience and, you know, whole organism behavior, yes, absolutely. But I think there's been also some beautiful works of, of trying to estimate the amount of noise accumulation. Um, and I'll find the link in a second, but I can't type and talk. And um, where people look basically, if you have if it, it, a task that requires fine visual per distinction perception that you perform, how much noise are you picking up in the loop from, from the distinguishing of the task to the exact and correct execution? And, and there's an estimate roughly that you add roughly 30% of the noise that you have in the basic task onto, onto the information. Um, and I'll find the citation now and let uh, someone else speak a bit more. Okay, we're, we're getting close to the hour too, so I think we could. You're probably going to take another question, but then we can probably wrap it up. So, um, here's one I think that's interesting um, by Ivan Rubio Venegas. Um, how do you make papers about models directed to experimentalists when involving very complex mathematics? This is a great question. Mm -hmm. 
This is a great question. And, and it's, yeah, I think this is really a great question. And because whenever you're a computational neuroscientist, you are essentially writing for experimentalists and, 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 and vice versa. So, so you need to be able to express yourself correctly. So how do we do this? Um, yeah, I, so the first thing is to recognize that math phobia is very real. Um, and that oh, like for, for real, like the, it, it's very daunting for, for a lot of people. And, uh, and in my past, it has been daunting for me too. And so um, uh, there, there have also been studies that, that show that uh, abstracts that say exactly the same thing, but have more or, or like less equations in them are judged differently by, by different groups in terms of reviewer scores and so on. Um, so I think the the thing to do is to not assume that everybody can just read a wall of equations and get the same thing out of it that you do, and that every single uh, set of equations that you um, that you write needs to be accompanied by an explanation in uh, that that demonstrates the intuition. Um, and so by writing a, a set of models or like a, a modeling paper where you have like the intuitive explanation and then you have like the math and you and you they go hand in hand. Um, that's really a way to to broaden the impact and uh, and the exposure of your model, but also to to uh, facilitate this harmony that's really necessary between the modeling community and the experimental community. Um, and also it's the mark of a good modeler to be able to, to describe this stuff in, jet, in in true intuition, like to provide examples that demonstrate the ideas in a way that doesn't rely on math. Because if you can do that, if you can explain your model to someone who is not a modeler, then you really understand it well and you really have a good grasp on what you're doing. And it's also more likely that you haven't you know, missed something somewhere along the line that got buried in the equations. In, in plain words, you shouldn't need any math in your papers, maybe in the supplemental information for those modelers that are reading your work. But if your audience, if your customers are people who are non-mathematical driven, then you should be able to explain it in simple words. And of course, if you have a good model, that model will give you an explanation, right? And you verbalize that explanation and, and that what brings the message across. So very strongly recommend in both talks and papers, not to have any equations in the main figure, unless you want to use it to a, you know, convey a sort of slightly more complicated idea, like you know, weighted addition of something that that people can follow if you talk them through, and then you literally explain every element of the equation. Or for again, science, social sociology, for some reason, you need to impress your audience that you're a very smart person. And then I've seen people dead slightly, you know, throwing math at people. But in general, I think you should be able to talk to it in, about it in plain English. And part of providing the plain English and intuitive explanation is, as as we're seeing in the chat here, uh, the the visualizations also. So if you can use visualizations and you say like, here, if I put this input into the model, this is how it behaves, and you show uh, in the same output space as the behavior or the neuroscience phenomenon that you're trying to explain. You show how your model behaves and you show how if I turn this knob, this parameter in the model, that this is how the model changes its behavior, its predictions. That's also a fantastic way to provide this intuitive explanation uh, that is precise um, in a way that, that you know, math is precise, but also gives the, the plain English you know, gut feeling intuition. But I think I'm just seeing some of the answers in the chat uh, and the comments. It really depends on the audience. If your general audience is math free, be math free. If your audience wants precise definitions, theorem proofs and so forth, then you need to give that to them. But you need to cater to the audience. But never ever would I use mathematics just to show off in some way. Don't talk above your audience, talk with your audience. And that's the fundamental message for any communication that you do. Yeah, they'll, they'll have a much better uh, impression on your audience if if everybody in the audience walks away having understood what was going on instead of being like, wow, I have no idea what just happened. Like that guy seemed really smart or that gal seemed really smart, but I have no idea what they were saying. That's a much less good way <laughs> to communicate to your audience.
Awesome. So, so we're we're already past the hour, so we should wrap it up. But maybe if you have any final words, final advice for our students and TAs and other listeners um, about modeling, what should you never do? What should you always do? What should you never do? What should you always do? Um, so I think uh, don't get frustrated if your model doesn't fit. <laughs> That's one of the, the big the big things that I've had to learn through my own frustrations over a really long time. And that um, also happens a lot is that your model never quite works exactly the way you want it to. And if it does, it's probably because you did something wrong. <laughs> if it fits the data perfectly, then that should also like raise your spidey sense that something kind of crazy is happening. Um, but don't get frustrated because the systems that we're trying to explain and understand are really hard. They're really complex. And even if we build super complex models, they are, I think Gunnar, you said this yesterday in the Q&A, by definition, abstractions. They are by definition, simplifications. And so your model is not gonna be perfect, but the ways in which it, it, it works and the ways in which it doesn't work, those are informative. So don't get frustrated, keep at it. I think, what I think is important is that modeling is just a tool, like many other tools that you have. It's 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 a path. It's not the end and goal. And so, what's really ultimately important is that, like with any tool, why are you using the tool? So always ask yourself the question: Why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I doing the right thing? Challenge that. And from the fantastic questions that we got today, I really feel you're on the right path for that. And that's really what matters. Yeah, these questions are great. Oh, and for all of the many questions that we didn't get to, please continue the conversation in the forums and also you can wander around in the Mozilla hubs and ask them there and talk to each other there. Because um, there's a lot that we didn't get to. So please don't don't feel like this is the end. Keep, keep talking. Great. Well, with that, thank you so much, Aldo. Thank you so much, Megan, for being here. Thanks, everyone. It's really a lot of fun. And everyone else, Enjoy your projects, brainstorming. Woohoo! Bye, guys. Bye.